So what if there's a way to print TPU at the same speed or faster than you currently print PLA? In this video I will show you how I managed to do this and how I managed to actually improve quality at the same time. Are there really TPU cheat codes? Well, honestly, kind of, in as much as there's a set of rules that you can follow to dramatically increase your quality and reliability, especially when it comes to printing TPU on a Bowden style printer like the Ender 3, 5 and so on. But they're not magic of course, this is about understanding the intricacies of printing TPU and leveraging it to your advantage. If you haven't already seen my first TPU video, then add it to your viewing list and check it out after this one. A card should appear about now for that. Okay then, we have got a lot to cover in this video, so strap in, let's go. Flexible materials are... flexible. The hint is in the name, honestly. But if you imagine trying to push an elastic band down a tube and expect to be able to control how much comes out the other end, then you get the idea of what we're up against when we're printing TPU. Of course, a lot of the process is engineered to make it work better. For example, the tube in question is made of PTFE, which is one of the slippiest materials known to man, and the width of the tube is practically the same as the diameter of the filament, so it gives it nowhere to hide. If we have a look at this badly drawn representation of a Bowden setup, you can see the general process. The point I want to make here is that you have a setup that works almost like a hydraulic system, because the filament is liquid at the business end. So if you think of it that way, then you have a large cross section at the extruder, where you're applying the force, effectively 2.4 square millimetres, and at the liquid end you have a cross-sectional area of 0.4mm on a 0.4mm nozzle, obviously, and that's 0.13 square millimetres. So this means around a 20 to 1 ratio between the extruder and the nozzle. Now importantly, pressure is the enemy of flexible filaments, or rather excess pressure is the enemy too little pressure and it will just compress inside the tube and not extrude at all, but too much pressure build up while printing, which is the more common problem in a Bowden setup, will eventually cause a failure, as in the diagram, the first weak link in the chain is the extruder. So you get filament popping out, looping around the gears or being ground up, this is the normal thing that happens when you try to print with TPU on a Bowden. It's actually kind of a sign of a problem, not the problem itself. If your filament is doing this, then... It's kind of an emergency pressure valve. It's a sign that you should be managing the pressure better. One thing we can do to lower the pressure uh, that we're going to look at today is nozzle cross-sectional area. So yes, in a way, this was a really long way of asking if a 0.6mm nozzle would enable us to print TPU faster and with less errors. I think it's just important to explain why as well as to pose the question. I want to introduce you to the Monoprice Mini Delta. If you're subscribed to Dr. Vax's channel, he's changed his name but that's what I remember him as, then you'll already have seen this printer. In fact, they've recently released a new version which is... interesting. The Monoprice Mini Delta is to printers what a hammer is to precision machine screws. With absolutely no bed levelling and a Bowden extruder that would work better on TPU if you had the tube sticking out the side where it invariably spits it, these machines are ideal to test our theory out. Don't worry, we'll get to the end of printers in a bit, humour me. I'm fitting one of my deltas with a 0.6mm nozzle and the other one with a 08 I'm already well aware that neither of these printers can print satisfactorily on 0.4mm, so there's little point having a control. The control is literally just spitting filament out of the side of the extruder. Let's see how these printers cope with the larger nozzles. Before we get the results though, I want to discuss TPU filament. I know that's what we're doing in this whole video, but specifically TPU filament. If you've bought multiple brands, then you're probably aware that there's a massive range of what's sold and described as 95A. 95A is a hardness rating that's ascertained by poking a sort of stick into a block of the material and figuring out from there what the displacement of the stick is. So either it's not a good measurement of how filament actually is, or more likely most of these filaments have never been hardness tested or rated at all, or they're just being sold as 95A when they're clearly not. I couldn't tell you what true 95A feels like, but... I guess it might be one of these? I don't know if it comes across on screen how much stiffer some of these are than the others. And I want to point out that Newly is notably stiffer than the rest by quite a margin. Newly filament is easily the most Bowden friendly TPU I've come across, which honestly it's not necessarily an endorsement of it as a material, but it's more that it's the least likely to fail under pressure. 
and as a result you can typically print faster with it than the others on a Bowden. This is basically due to it just being stiffer. Of course, the downside is it's stiffer when it's printed too. On the newly blue TPU and the 0.6 nozzle, the results were night and day better on the Mini Delta. I was printing at PLA speeds quite happily, I even took the time to make some feeds for the printer since I've been balancing it on random objects ever since its original sticky blob things fell off. This might make it less noisy too, silent drivers this printer does not have. And this is this is why I recommend the newly filament. Being able to print at speeds like 30mm per second for example on a 0.6mm nozzle with decent results, especially for this printer, it makes printing TPU a breeze, so this is undoubtedly a game changer. And while my fast draft settings might look a bit meh in places on the Pikachu here, this is due to the settings, the line height and things like that. If you use more conservative settings, you would get better results. So straight away, this looks really promising for 0.6mm nozzles. Unfortunately, not so much for 0.8mm nozzles, and the experiment did take a bit of a dark turn from here. First I tried the blue filament, the same filament on the 0.8mm nozzle machine, and to my surprise the results did not improve, in fact very much the contrary. To be fair the pressure situation was not a problem, the extruder never failed, even at high speed, but the output was unsatisfactory. I tried different filaments and the results just weren't getting any better. This finish, if you wanted it intentionally it would be fun, but I don't. What on earth happened? This is where the experiment diverges. I couldn't understand what was happening, so I went back to the 0.6 filter and tried the other filaments. I was sure to print slower this time because I know that these filaments are more flexible, they will fail, so I went with around 10mm per second or less to be on the safe side. Confusingly though, none of the other filaments would perform nearly as well as that one reel of blue Nuli. And when I tried a temperature tower of just even green Nuli, it was horrible. It took me a long time to work out what was going on here because it's not what you would expect. Believe it or not, this is not a problem with the machine or the nozzle size, it's a problem with established facts. We'll come back to this though because the next thing I did was assume that if my green Nuli was printing like this and making popping sounds when it printed too, then it must be wet. Established internet knowledge says that if your filament pops and looks like this, then it's wet. Never mind that I just opened it, Nuli must be at fault. They must be supplying me wet filament. How dare they? So into the dryer it went for 12 hours. And it didn't work at all. Because it wasn't wet. It's never moisture, it's kind of a running joke that I have in my head be because nobody else gets the joke, but it's never moisture. So next I put the same filament onto the Ender 3 V2 and I chose my best TPU setting that I have in Cura and, well, this came out. I'll cut a long story short by just explaining without the series of boat bits and head scratching and many hours wasted. It turns out that TPU has a speed limit. Not an upper speed limit, of course it has an upper speed limit. Too much speed is too much pressure and gets chewed up in extruder, we know that. No, it has a lower speed limit. If you print TPU at very low speeds, well, let me demonstrate. Do you see what it's doing under the macro lens? Exactly, it's kind of dripping. The pressure, believe it or not, is apparently too low. Of course, this is going to be worse with larger nozzle sizes, so this kind of explains what's going on with the 0.8. I told you this was not what you expected. I never did manage to find a balance between pressure, speed and print quality for a 0.8mm nozzle, so I can't recommend it in the end, but I did for 0.6mm. So let's talk time, but first let's talk math. 0.4 to 0.6mm is a difference of what, 50%? Right? Wrong. Did you ever see 10 inch pizzas sold for £6.99 or whatever your currency is and 12 inch ones sold for say £8.99? Well, thanks to basic maths you should always go for the 12 inch, and here's why. The cross-sectional area of a cylinder, which a pizza is a really short cylinder I guess, is pi r squared, obviously. We all know that, or at least we do now. So a 10 inch pizza has 5 squared, because radius is half of diameter, times pi. Uh, it's unfortunate really that they don't sell pizzas by radius, I think that would be funnier. But anyway, 78.5 square inches of pizza from a 10 inch pizza. It sounds like a lot actually, doesn't it, when it comes down to square inches. And a 12 inch pizza has 6 squared times pi, which is 113 square inches, which is 44% more. So you're getting nearly half again for 2 of your local currency more. 
Yes, please. Anyway, there's a point to this digression, not just about pizza. The same applies to nozzles. The conversion from a 0.4 nozzle to a 0.6 nozzle increases the cross-sectional area from 0.126 mm2 to 0.283 mm2, which is, yeah, it's more than double, isn't it? And this is why the pressure is lowered so much when you switch up to a 0.6 mm, and this is why a 0.8 mm is just too far, and this is why the real benefit here is the time that you save. So yeah, let's talk time. Yes, I, I know that some of these results are quite scruffy. The prep for this video took a lot of twists and turns, and I didn't want to just repeat timing experiments and waste material, and in some cases just whatever, you know, consider it to be a draft mode. Focus on the actual time taken and the rest will fall into place at the end of the video, honest. So a 0.4mm 3 wall bench on my standard settings with 0.2 layer height takes around 3.5 hours, so that's your benchmark for a sort of basic 0.4mm bench with any kind of decent finish. Whereas the very same settings on a 0.6 nozzle but with 0.4 layer height takes only 1 hour 8 minutes. And on a 0.8mm nozzle with 0.6 layer height, which looks horrible, but it only takes 43 minutes. Now you can go more conservative with the layer heights, so maybe to get a bit better quality or if you're having problems with those layer heights. So you could say these times here. So you can see that when you look at time savings, you're printing the same model in less than half the time, even with more conservative settings, there are massive time savings to be made. I had this thing kicking around, and in a moment of anger while I was getting annoyed with the 0.8mm nozzle, I decided to fit this to that Delta machine instead of the standard stock extruder. Surprisingly, it actually fit, though configuration was more involved than I'd have liked. For for one, it ran backwards, and it's also geared around 3 to 1 ratio compared to the old one, both of which can be fixed in config, of course, but I also had a weird buzzing of the stepper which I solved by just retracting slower, so I actually ended up with a retract speed limit on this machine, which I'm not that happy about. I suspect this is due to the three times larger step size, but this video is long enough without looking into that. I'll probably do a video just on this extruder maybe, but it is way more resilient when it comes to soft TPU, and that's the point. I was able to print even the softest TPU that I own on this printer, which I hadn't even been close to be able to do before. I even swapped back to a 0.4 nozzle, and this extruder still handled it really well. So what I wanted to point out here is that that this extruder is better than the stock one for TPU at least if you can overcome the technical aspects of installation and configuration. Oh and also when you're putting this together the gear goes on like this not the other way around. I made that mistake and it chewed up the plastic gear a bit. No massive harm done in my case but it's just a heads up if you're installing one. Having learned a lot on the mini delta end of the experiment I took this and I applied it to my two end of three printers. Essentially, there's no difference between the 3 and the 3v2 from the perspective of TPU printing, but I did also fit a 0.6mm nozzle on my v2. Results were exactly as expected. The ender printers take a lot of flack for being low end, but they really do perform. I'll let the output speak for itself. And by the end of the prep for the video, this red TPU had arrived, so I had to try and print it out with the 0.6 nozzle. It looks fantastic considering it printed in literally one hour. It is controversial, but in my profiles for these prints, I have the outer wall speed faster than the infill, and in some cases faster than the inner wall. My theory is that I want to be able to get shiny outer walls while allowing pressure to level out a bit during the infill and inner walls, which can print a bit slower. It seems to work, so for the time being, this is exactly what I recommend doing in your profiles. It seems like a cheat code to me, it's the exact opposite of what the defaults do. And as you can see, it certainly seems to work. I'm going to show you my settings now, pause and copy them, but I'm also sharing them on the website. The link is below in the description. These settings work on the Ender 3 and the V2 on any bed texture because TPU is tolerant to just about any surface you're printing it on. The settings also give me good results with all my filaments, and I've tested it out on both the Ender 3 models and the Ender 3 V2 with glass and textured beds. The settings work well out of the box for all three colours of the newly filaments that I tried in this video, and it also works for the Blue Zero filament and Sunlu. If you find yourself looking for these filaments after watching this video, then links are in the description for each, and you can apparently support the channel if you buy through those links, although I just set this up, so who knows if it'll actually work. 
And of course, if you want to perfect your prints even more by fine-tuning the retract settings of the temperature, then go and check out my other TPU video. Link is in the description or the card I already showed you at the beginning. Don't switch off yet, this is the most important bit. I want to tie everything up into some fairly neat advice based on everything I found during this video. You're squishing, which adds extra pressure. Newton's second law, I guess. The bed is pushing back at you, so don't push your look on layer 1. It typically doesn't matter if layer 1 looks awful, so it's absolutely a good idea to put your first layer speed down to 10mm per second or less. I tend to do a 50% thicker first layer at half normal speed, so this doesn't make it thicker because Cura will compensate by lifting the head further up, but what it does do is it gives you more filament being spat out to work with uh, to, to, to get into the bed, so it gives you less chance of poor adhesion. I'm going to show you a trick that most of us know already, but I think few people actually do it in reality because it sort of... I don't know, everyone talks about it, I very rarely see it done. This is a butane torch. Be careful with these, they are pretty gnarly, but I'm using this one as opposed to a lighter because quicker, directional, and you don't get any soot. You just turn it on and you wave it over the piece and the strings just disappear. And, okay, bigger ones turn into warts. But yeah, that's a cool trick for dealing with those messy, hairy bits that somehow you always seem to find in your food an hour later. I never really understood how that works. Okay, so this is important to kind of find some semblance of advice to give you out of all of this. Firstly, a 0.6mm nozzle is actually a really good way to print TPU on a Bowden to get faster and more reliable prints. It is a game changer. You of course sacrifice some resolution, but remember you can still print lower line heights, so really the loss of resolution is largely restricted to the top and bottom of things. So would I recommend a 0.6mm nozzle for TPU? Yes, especially if you either print mostly TPU or you have a dedicated machine for it or you have large pieces of TPW to print. Secondly, do not waste your time with a 0.8mm or bigger. At no point did I get satisfactory results at any time during these experiments. You might be able to, but I guarantee it is not worth the sacrifice. Thirdly, we learned that for good results when printing TPU, you need the outermost wall to be printed at between 15 and 30 millimeters per second. This is what makes it smooth and shiny. Lower than this will give poor or inconsistent results, depending on the brand, I guess. Fourthly and finally, you can increase the range of filaments you're able to print with if you upgrade to a BMG style extruder, although I, perhaps irrationally, I don't think this would be what I'd want to do on my main 3D printer. I'm happy to have one machine with this extruder on, but I just prefer the stock extruder on the ender and calibrating e-steps was a hassle and not without its faults. While it is a game changer of sorts, I would only recommend doing this on a dedicated TPU machine, but it is entirely up to you. So this is the end of another video that proves that you absolutely don't need a direct drive printer to print TPU. And with that, I'm off to check out Ender 3 direct drive upgrades. For science. As usual, let me know what you think in the comments. I'll tell you what I think. I think this has given me a headache. But what a result though. Thank you for watching.